This video is sponsored by World Anvil. This year, I'm starting a video series where I talk about different RPG campaign settings to highlight their strengths and weaknesses. Mostly, these will not have monthly installments, since normally it takes a lot of time to sit down and read all of the books and paratext for a campaign setting. However, today's campaign setting is one that I'm already familiar enough with to discuss. In fact, this setting is perhaps the campaign setting that inspired this entire series. I'm not going to pretend I know everything about it, but I've read a lot of the stuff that new DMs are expected to know about it for 5th edition. I don't like the Forgotten Realms, at least as the default campaign setting for official Dungeons & Dragons products. I know I've mentioned this in previous videos, and some folks might be tired of hearing me say this, but I just want to get this subject off of my chest, and then hopefully I can stop talking about it. Now, I want to be really clear about what we're doing here today. I'm not trying to say that there's nothing good about the Forgotten Realms, and I'm certainly not trying to say that you're wrong if you like the setting. I honestly wish I liked it. I'd love to have stronger ties to that world. And maybe someday I will, although the fact that it would require more work than I've already done is a larger issue, and we'll get to that later. I'm also not trying to say that it's bad in every incarnation. There are decades of novels set in the Forgotten Realms. I'm sure a lot of them are great. And in fact, someday I do want to sit down and read some Forgotten Realms novels, because I'm sure the world as it's presented in those books doesn't have all the same issues we're going to discuss today. Heck, I'm not even going to talk about the version of the Forgotten Realms that was presented as a separate product for previous editions, because ultimately, the Realms itself is only part of the problem. The main issue I have with the Realms is also tied up in what I think a good default D&D setting should offer its audience. Before we get too deep into this, let's catch everybody up. If you're not familiar, The Forgotten Realms is the name of a world created by writer Ed Greenwood as a setting for the stories he came up with as a child. He started publishing content for The Realms in magazine articles for D&D, and The Realms eventually became a huge pillar of content for Dungeons & Dragons. As I've said, there have been novels published continuously in The Forgotten Realms for decades, and the most popular of these are undoubtedly the R.A. Salvatore novel starring Driz Doerden, a heroic drow who has turned his back on his people and his culture. People love those Driz books, man oh man. I haven't read them, so I can't speak to what they're like. Although, a few years back, Audible did this cool, free audiobook of a collection of short stories about Driz and his supporting cast. Each one was read by a different narrator from film and TV and similar industries. All of them were really cool narrators. I liked that book. It's not free anymore, but it's a good read. The Forgotten Realms also has a bunch of famous cities that you might recognize from other media, specifically Neverwinter, which is the location for an online video game and will appear in the new D&D movie in March, and Baldur's Gate, which was the location for several extremely popular video games. The Forgotten Realms is in a lot of ways, a fairly generic fantasy world that plays by the typical rules of D&D. Anything you'd expect to find in the Monster Manual is somewhere in the Forgotten Realms, and you could probably drop any module into the realms with very little difficulty. The most well-known and well-explored area of the Forgotten Realms is the Sword Coast, and I'd argue these terms are basically synonymous. Although the Forgotten Realms contains a lot of other areas besides the Sword Coast, in my experience, the Sword Coast is what most D&D players imagine when they hear someone mention the Forgotten Realms. The Sword Coast is host to a few major cities, Baldur's Gate, Waterdeep, and Neverwinter. North of that, you get the Spine of the World mountain range and the frozen landscape of Icewind Dale. To the east, you have Thay, a sinister nation run by a lich and which hosts an endless supply of evil wizards to fight. There are a bunch of other nations with cool lore and evocative descriptions, some of them modeled after non-white nations throughout real-world history. Obviously, I can't speak to whether or not this was handled thoughtfully, since I'm only passingly familiar with the non-Sword Coast aspects of the world, but... If you're tired of the Sword Coast, there's a ton of other stuff out there to explore. And this brings us to the first question on my campaign setting rubric. Does the Forgotten Realms have a clear premise? And the answer? Sure. Well, as clear as any D&D world. Although there's an asterisk here. The original premise was more interesting and distinct. In the original fiction, the real world Earth and the world of the Forgotten Realms used to be more closely connected long, long ago. But as time passed, the inhabitants of Earth basically forgot about the existence of that other world, which is why the setting is called the Forgotten Realms. This plays into ideas that are present with other fantasy worlds like Middle-earth or Narnia that supposedly have ties to our world, but Forgotten Realms is given a much clearer idea for how it was once connected with our world. Honestly, I don't know if you can sum up the modern version of the Forgotten Realms with an elevator pitch besides, this is a traditional fantasy world. 
But that's kind of all we need, especially for a default campaign setting. A few major cities, no major government to connect them, some notable nations far away that invite further adventures. In a lot of ways, it has all the pieces of a default campaign setting. In theory, it works. Okay, but I guess I need to clarify something because there's a term I've been using throughout this video and it's going to be relevant going forward. What do I mean when I talk about a default D&D setting? Well, in older editions, the core rulebooks presented a pretty generic D&D world in the text. Technically, I think 3rd edition and 3.5 defaulted to Greyhawk, another setting I should probably talk about at some point, but based on my recollection, it was presented in a way that didn't really tie it too strongly to Greyhawk. It could have been anywhere for your purposes as a GM. To my admittedly limited knowledge, aside from the gods presented, it didn't seem like there was anything you needed to know to use the setting right out of the core books. If I've missed the mark on this, let me know in the comments, but it's kind of not the point I'm trying to make here. 4th edition created its own setting, called the Nentir Vale, but really that was just a region where they could set some adventures when they needed to. Apparently the Pantheon was a mix of deities from Greyhawk, Forgotten Realms, and some that were created for that edition. And I'm sorry, it was a perfect Pantheon. It is my gold standard for a great spread of deities for your game. It's not too daunting, there are less than a dozen gods, but they're all interesting and compelling even in just the few paragraphs that appear in the player's handbook. Thankfully, the exact same pantheon appears in Critical Role products, so their legacy carries on. I have no strong feelings about the Nentir Vale as a setting, but I really think the design approach behind this world sums up a lot of what I look for in a default campaign setting. Towns and cities are considered points of light, and the rest of the world is in a dark age, a sea of unknown and unpredictable dangers. The core book specifically left most of the world vague and uncharted, and this is an approach I really, really like. There are some campaign settings where it's useful to have some more definition, but I personally feel that the default setting for a role-playing game, or at least a game like Dungeons & Dragons, should be a points of light setting. It gives game masters a lot more room to play in the space and a lot more freedom to use what's provided, but not feel too locked into existing lore. It's kind of the vibe I want my own campaign settings to achieve because I think it inspires adventure and evokes the kind of fantasy games I enjoy. This is why I say that I don't think The Forgotten Realms serves that role well. I don't think The Forgotten Realms is a bad setting, although it's not perfect and it's maybe not always to my taste, but I just don't think it should have been the default setting. Of course, I understand why the folks at Wizards of the Coast didn't make an original default campaign setting for 5th edition. Aside from the fact that they wanted to promote their IP and highlight what they could provide that their competition couldn't, it's also a lot of work to create a brand new campaign setting that has everything a new game master could want for their games, but doesn't overload them with too much information. Of course, creating your own setting is easier than ever thanks to today's sponsor, World Anvil. World Anvil is an online toolkit that you can use to create and record any information you might need for your campaign setting. They have a bunch of incredible features that make it so much easier for you to actually keep track of your lore in ways you can't really do with any other record keeping service. One thing I know game masters love doing is making up centuries of backstory for their games, and it can be really tough to handle that kind of thing. Thankfully, World Anvil has a terrific Chronicles feature where you can import your map and then link the events of your world across multiple timelines to different locations on the map. If you visit worldanvil.com and use the promo code SUPERGEEK, you can save 40% off of any annual membership. Thank you so much to World Anvil for sponsoring this video. So the Forgotten Realms might not be a points of light setting, but that doesn't mean it's bad. Although, I'll also admit, your mileage may vary on that front. Certainly there are plenty of random encounters, I'm not going to pretend the roads in the wilderness are safe. But does that mean that it's a points of light setting? I don't think so. I think the fact that there are three major civilization hubs in a row in the place where adventurers are expected to begin their journey works against the goals of a points of light fantasy. So, since this isn't a points of light setting, here's the second question from my rubric. Does the Forgotten Realms have a distinct tone? I think it basically does. It's a fairly standard high fantasy setting. There are adventuring schools and magical libraries. There's a town with a beacon of light above it. Not the sun, a separate beacon of light. But the way it evokes the high fantasy vibe and creates its distinct tone is something I'm personally not a fan of. Again, especially in a lot of the 5e game products, a lot of setting details are presented in a way that makes the world seem especially artificial. In practice, I don't like the way 5e adventures and handbooks set in the Forgotten Realms have so many high-level NPCs who have class levels. A bunch of major characters who run the world or provide plot hooks or run the local shops are all high-level wizards or paladins or rogues or whatever. In theory, it's fine. I know why they do it. 
A lot of these characters were former PCs in real-world games, and even when they weren't, including them is probably meant to show players that they can be ambitious and one day be notable figures in their D&D games. But in practice, having a bunch of high-level NPCs floating around runs the risk of reducing the stakes for any adventure. If Tiamat is rising, why aren't all of these archmages dealing with it? Why isn't every mid-level paladin we meet in each adventure diving into the Underdark to slay demon lords? Additionally, creating a world where basically every NPC has character class levels, and everywhere you go has some organization or club that is tailor-made to suit one of the character classes your players might play, to me, these details make it feel less like a world and more like, this is the best way I know how to put it, a Disneyland pre-show that plays on a screen while you're waiting to board the ride, as these famous NPCs turn to you and say, Thank goodness you're here, new recruit. We can't do this without you. We're especially welcoming to bards, clerics, and paladins. I also hate just about every Forgotten Realm's proper noun. Aside from those three major cities and a few other spots on the map, hardly any of the names sound like something a human being would ever say. The non-human names get a bit of a pass a bit more often, because honestly, having the balls to name a major city Menzo Baronzen is genuinely impressive. And someday I'd be curious to check out the older Forgotten Realms content and see if most of the names I like have been there from the beginning and the ones I don't like are new. That would be interesting to find out. But what about character names? Well, somehow they're worse. So many of the NPC names in every Forgotten Realms adventure either just have the generic adjective noun last name, or their name looks like someone tripped down the stairs carrying a basket of typewriters. Or sometimes, it's both. I'm looking at you, Dralmorer Born Grey. Now this next question ties into a lot of what we just discussed. Does the Forgotten Realms have iconic imagery? I think this is definitely true. I'd argue there's no clearer indication of that than the existence of the Yawning Portal, a tavern that leads directly down to a mega dungeon underneath the biggest city in the region. I mean, honestly, Drizzt is also pretty iconic, but that's not quite what I mean in this category. I think there are some iconic locations, Waterdeep, Baldur's Gate, Neverwinter, but beyond that, I think the Red Wizards of Thay are maybe the most iconic aspect of the realms, at least as far as what I've come across. The Red Wizards, with their shaved heads covered in tattoos, are one of those aspects of lore that just immediately scream, I am from the Forgotten Realms. And that's exactly what this category is meant to cover. Honestly, most of the other iconic imagery is just general D&D stuff, but Forgotten Realms has all of it, for whatever that's worth. Now here's the next question. Does the Forgotten Realms provide character creation inspiration? When your players look at the information available to them as they're rolling up their characters, do they get inspired to make the type of character that could only exist in the Forgotten Realms? Well, I don't think so, but before I explain myself, I want to acknowledge the exceptions. I don't think this is true for the Drow because of the Drizzt novels. And honestly, someone could want to play a family member of a specific NPC from a book or a comic or a video game or even the upcoming movie, but that's true of every campaign setting we'll talk about. You can always play a famous NPC's brother or child or nibbling. So stepping away from that option, no, I don't think so. Sure, the Forgotten Realms has a bunch of iconic cities, but what actually sets them apart culturally in a way that gives you something to work with? What functionally is the difference between being from Baldur's Gate, being from Neverwinter, and being from Waterdeep? Does it matter? I don't think it does. Now there are also some other nations your character can be from, especially if you want to play an ethnic minority, but what information does the player's handbook give you about playing someone from these regions? If you're a human, you get basically nothing. Here are a few sample paragraphs from the player's handbook about different fictional nationalities from the Forgotten Realms that you can belong to. Kalashite. Shorter and slighter in build than most other humans, Kalashites have dusky brown skin, hair, and eyes. They're found primarily in the southwest Faerun. Faerun is the continent where you can find the Sword Coast. Dameron. Found primarily in the northwest of Faerun, Damerons are of moderate height and build, with skin hues ranging from tawny to fair. Their hair is usually brown or black, and their eye color varies wildly, though brown is the most common. Shu. The Shu are the most numerous and powerful ethnic group in Karatur, far to the east of Faerun. They are yellowish bronze in hue with black hair and dark eyes. Shu surnames are usually presented before the given name. And so on. There are a bunch of these, and each one has some sample names included. And none of these tell us anything about these cultures, aside from strongly hinting toward parallels with some real-world cultures. The only Forgotten Realms culture that gets any additional detail is the Mulan. 
Their hair ranges from black to dark brown, but in the lands where the Mulan are most prominent, nobles and many other Mulan shave off their hair. Do you feel prepared to play someone of Mulan ancestry? Aside from being a place where you can find some names for a bunch of different cultures, does anybody really use this section of the book when they're playing a Forgotten Realms game? What does this add, really? Now, they also released a whole book about the Sword Coast, but setting aside the fact that the Sword Coast book is painfully short, well, you'd think the default setting would have some details in the first book it appears in, the first book it assumes you'll interact with when rolling up a Forgotten Realms character, the Player's Handbook. If they're going to put so much emphasis on the Forgotten Realms as the default setting, why isn't there any useful information in the first book they give you? Now, if you're familiar with the source material, you might have a ton of reasons you want to play a Dark Elf. After all, that culture has been in a bunch of books, and honestly, it's one of the most well-known aspects of the world. But beyond that, I just don't think there's much here to inspire a player to create a character that feels like they're part of the Forgotten Realms specifically. Okay, but once players have rolled their characters and entered the world and they have more options in front of them, do they get inspired to interact with the world? Does the Forgotten Realms offer plot hooks? Yes, I actually do think so. I complained about this earlier with my Disneyland comparison, but in this category, that actually becomes a feature and not a bug. The Forgotten Realms doesn't have a ton of uncharted regions to explore, and we'll come back to that later, but there is a ton of stuff that players are still encouraged to interact with. One thing that I think the 5e material makes really good use of would be the factions. In these 5e Forgotten Realms products, the same five factions keep making appearances. The Harpers, the Lord's Alliance, the Emerald Enclave, the Order of the Gauntlet, and the Zentarim. While I don't think they're always used as effectively as they probably could be, their presence adds a lot of opportunities for player engagement. Additionally, there's a ton of content for game masters to work with. Obviously, there are a bunch of published adventures that take place in the realms, and as these books continue to focus on exploring specific locations, they offer more opportunity to build a more complete perspective of the realms. But there is also a ton of lore from older editions and other fictional works. There are multiple YouTube channels that have dozens, if not hundreds, of videos dedicated to highlighting various aspects of the Forgotten Realms lore. But that leads to the next big question. Does the Forgotten Realms have daunting lore? Yes. Yes, 1000%. This is honestly why I'm making this video in the first place. This is my biggest complaint with the Forgotten Realms as the default campaign setting for 5th edition. I think it puts DMs who don't know the Forgotten Realms lore into a tough spot if their players know the world better than them. In previous editions, Forgotten Realms handbooks were their own products, the way Eberron and the Magic the Gathering settings are in 5th edition. So in those days, a GM could opt into running games in that setting if they felt comfortable doing so. But when the Forgotten Realms is the default setting, there's definitely a pressure on game masters to run games set in the realms. And when they do, Players might come to the table with decades of experience with the setting, from novels and video games and comics and maybe other published products which the GM doesn't have. And that means players might have unfair expectations. If I picked up a copy of a generic sci-fi game, but all of the adventures took place in the Star Trek universe, which I know very little about, then I might not really be able to answer my players' questions when they come up. I find that the exact same thing happens in this case. I generally don't think that the default D&D setting should even have very much detail at all, but even if you don't feel the same way, I think the Forgotten Realms is an especially poor choice for a setting for this exact reason. Now, to their credit, the folks at Wizards of the Coast eventually realized this was an issue and told us not to worry too hard about the previous decades of lore. This was a good thing to do. I genuinely think it's useful to tell players and GMs not to stress out about the fact that the Forgotten Realms has more lore than the MCU. But I also wonder what exactly that leaves the Forgotten Realms with. What sets the Forgotten Realms apart from other fantasy settings besides the presence of lots and lots of lore? Which brings me to my final question. Does the Forgotten Realms have blank spaces on the map? This doesn't have to be literal, it can also include major aspects of lore that haven't been fully explored, or unexplained phenomena that the writers deliberately left ambiguous. And generally? No. Not really. The Forgotten Realms, or at least the Sword Coast, which is the primary focus of most Forgotten Realms content, feels like it's been pretty thoroughly covered. And honestly, that's not uncommon for a campaign setting that has been continuously published since the 80s. This level of detail doesn't happen overnight, and it doesn't happen if audiences aren't interested in knowing more. 
I've said this before, but when you're creating your own campaign setting, there's no reason to get this granular with the detail, to fill in as much of the map and add as much detail as you might find in something like The Forgotten Realms, or Game of Thrones, or Star Wars. But if you're publishing Game of Thrones, resource books, or making a Star Wars TV show, or writing Forgotten Realms novels, then the audience probably wants more detail. And while writers don't always channel that attention to detail into the most interesting parts of the world, the creators of Star Wars content seem especially bad at understanding where they should add detail and where they should leave well enough alone. The truth is that you don't get to the point where you have decades of lore if something isn't popular. But for our purposes, reviewing the Forgotten Realms as the default D&D setting, I still think the amount of lore is way too daunting for a lot of new GMs. This isn't universal. There are some people who don't care and just use the parts they think are the most interesting and invent their own version of the world around those details. There are others who enjoy the challenge of finding out more information about the realms and getting a more complete picture. And there are still others who either loved the realms already or fell in love with it quickly enough that it doesn't feel like work. But I also know that there are a bunch of GMs who picked up these 5e adventures and saw all these references to Forgotten Realms lore and got intimidated. Some of them even got spooked off. And if the realms had just been provided in a separate, distinct product like Theros or Dragonlance or Spelljammer, we'd be having a totally different conversation. But I just don't think it should have been the default, because it increases the barrier to entry for GMs who know nothing about Dungeons & Dragons. Of course, it's possible I'm missing all the best parts of the Forgotten Realms. In fact, I think it's very likely that I am, and that the folks making 5th edition just aren't presenting the information in the most useful, actionable way. And that's exactly my point. I have to review these campaign settings based on what's readily available for GMs, and in my experience, the way the audience is invited to interface with the Forgotten Realms is far too intimidating and impenetrable. And when it's not, it's just not to my taste. And if you love the Forgotten Realms, I mean this sincerely, I would love to know what you love about it. Where do you recommend I start reading to get a version of the realms that is a lot more fun or interesting or exciting? What adventures or novels do you feel capture what makes this world work for you in a way that it just hasn't for me? If you got into the Forgotten Realms through 5th edition, how? What was that like? Let me know in the comments below. I still feel that the setting has some strong flaws when it comes to its 5th edition products, but that doesn't mean that it has nothing to offer. Thank you so much for watching, I'd imagine some folks won't be on the same page as me for this video, and that's okay, but I hope you at least understand where I'm coming from, even if you don't happen to agree with me. If you did like this video, then there are a few ways you can support this channel. You can subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about new videos as soon as they come out, which is every Monday and Thursday. You can support me financially on Patreon. Every new patron helps me unlock goals to improve the channel. You can join my Discord and participate in an awesome community that just loves these games. And you can sign up for my newsletter to stay up to date on the latest news and updates. Today I talked a little bit about the published 5th edition adventures, and I did not mean that to be an indictment of published adventures overall. They can be really useful, but if you're curious if you should run a published adventure or homebrew, check out this video right here. It talks a lot about that subject, and I think it's useful. Until next time, play fair, and have fun.